to see everybody here. Welcome to the Springs Church. My name is uh, Brian Mosley. Uh, I serve as the lead pastor here, and uh, I'm excited to share God's word with you. I want to say welcome also to everybody tuning in by way of YouTube. I feel like God really has an important message for us today as we continue our series called Spiritual Habits. All right, would you say that with me, please? Spiritual Habits. Uh, I've been asking you guys just a pointed question and asking you to think very rawly and just r- give me a real answer. You don't have to, it's a rhetorical question, so don't feel like you have to say the answer back. But I want to be a voice in your life that is asking you, how's your spiritual life? How are your spiritual habits? Are you, are you at a place in your spiritual life where you feel a little stagnant, like a little complacent or a little lost and you don't know what to do and you feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling and, and, you, and you're not sure where to go from here or are you being intentional about your spiritual life? You're here and I applaud you for that. Good job. Thank you for making church attendance a priority for your life where you can hear and, and experience. You can hear God's word and experience his presence in worship like we did earlier. Wasn't that amazing, by the way? But you're here and you're here to learn and you're here to, and to receive God's word and to, to learn from the scriptures and stuff. But, but how's your spiritual life when you, when you leave here, right? What about your work week? What about Monday through Saturday? I mean, I want to be that voice that's kind of exhorting us all the time. How's your spiritual life going? Because God is always calling us higher. Amen? He's always calling us deeper. He's always calling us to our next step in him. And with God, listen, this is the great news. There is always more. With God, there is always more. There is always more depth. There is always more riches of of revelation in him. And there's always more wonderful places that you and I can go in God, in our relationship with him. So I just want you to think about that this morning. Think about your, your spiritual life as we talk about today, as we talk about uh, the, the spiritual habits of silence, oh, that's beautiful, and solitude, right? Okay, so the Holy Spirit, this is kind of our key verse that we've been looking at every week, but the Holy Spirit said through the Apostle Paul, he, urge, he urges us with these words, and this is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. The Apostle Paul says, don't waste time. Arguing over foolish ideas and silly myths and legends. In other words, there are things we can do, there are things that we can talk about that are a complete waste of time. Amen? But Paul says, don't waste your time doing those things. But look at what he says. Spend your time and your energy in what? In the exercise of keeping spiritually fit. In other words, pay attention to your spiritual life. Pay attention to what's going on. Pay attention to your spiritual habits that God has provided for us in his scripture. He goes on to say bodily exercise is all right. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's good for you. But spiritual exercise is much more important. Would you say those words with me? Much more important. Important and it's a tonic for all that you do. What's a tonic? Well, it's something generally that you drink that's that refreshes you, that energizes you, that gives you uh, just a, a new level of energy. Anybody like drinking Red Bull? Okay, well, spiritual habits are kind of like an energy drink for your spirit, amen. It puts you in a place where you can grow in God and that you can take your next step in your maturity. Walking with him. So he says, so exercise yourself spiritually and practice being a better Christian. Because that will help you not only now in this life, but also in the life to come. So today we're going to talk about the spiritual habit of solitude and silence. And they're kind of go, they're two sides of the same coin, right? They're always most often linked together, the first, the first week we talked about Bible intake. 
And my friends, I cannot tell you enough how important it is that we stay in the scripture. That we stay in the word, that we are familiar, that we are intimately knowledgeable about the Bible. That's the first and, and honestly most important spiritual habit that you can have in your life. Are you meditating upon God's word? Are you reading God's word? Are you taking time to study and to apply God's word? You start there. The second week we talked about prayer. What is prayer? It's communication with God. God calls and expects his people to pray and to, com- and to pray continually, as we talked about last week. And this week, as we talk about solitude and silence, i got to be honest with you. When I look at my life, it's usually the opposite of solitude and silence. When I describe my life most days, it's like busyness and noise. Can anybody relate? Okay, or it's like hurry and a little bit of chaos. Kind of mixed in together. But solitude and silence doesn't necessarily describe my everyday life. So we're going to talk about those two habits, what they are, and how we can apply those to our everyday lives. Because, to be honest with you, these are a couple of the most neglected spiritual disciplines. Especially in Western Christian culture. Here's a simple working definition of solitude and silence. It's up on the screen if you're taking notes with me. Jot this down. To intentionally get quiet and get alone for spiritual purposes. To intentionally, on purpose, get quiet. Boy, isn't that hard. To get alone, sometimes that's even harder. For spiritual purposes. And what are the spiritual purposes? Not, not new age purposes. Not Buddhist purposes. No. But purposes where we can grow in our knowledge of God through the Holy Scriptures. Purposes where we can, where we can spend time in prayer. Dialoguing back and forth with our creator God. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. <clears throat> so intentionally get quiet. And intentionally on purpose get alone for spiritual purposes purposes. I read, a, I read a quote. This is a great book. Jot this down if you want to learn more about solitude and silence. There's an author named Ruth Barton, and she wrote a book called Invitation to Solitude and Silence. It's a great starting point if you're new to practicing solitude and silence. It's a great book to read, jam-packed with scripture. It's a very, very, very good resource for you. But in chapter two, Ruth says uh, something. I want to share it with you as we start here. It says this, To enter into solitude and silence is to take the spiritual life seriously. It is to take seriously the need to quiet the noise of our lives. To cease the constant striving of human effort. To pull away from our absorption into human relationships for a time. Why? In order to give God our undivided attention. Well, I read this and it just stuck out to me. I'm like, yes. This is the essence of solitude and silence. And I want my life to be filled with more of these kinds of moments. Isn't it amazing how accustomed we've become to activity and noise? We've become so accustomed to it that silence can actually be loud and awkward and uncomfortable. You ever heard the term that silence was deafening? Well, that, that is the absolute truth, especially with many of us in the culture in which we live where things have become so fast-paced and so busy and so hurried and loud and chaotic many times that we forget that there's a lot of noise going on in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts. And I think about this problem of noise. I think about the problem of noise and I think, well, there is a bunch of noise in our culture. Would you agree with that? There's a bunch of noise in our culture. There's, there's news, there's politics, there's terrorist attacks, there are all kinds of things. There's TV, 
There's cultural messages. There are advertisements that are just bombarding us from the culture in which we live, telling us things like, you deserve this, right? Or you need this. Or if it feels good, do it. Or the message of you were born that way, right? Or the message of violence is okay if it gets you what you want. These are all cultural messages that are, that are bombarding our minds. It's noise. It's a message like you've got to have that. Or you've got to achieve this in order to be successful. Or you've got to look a certain way or behave in a certain way in order to be a success in this world. What is that? That's noise. That's cultural noise. The second thing is I think about when I think about the problem of noise is the noise in, in our own heads, right? The noise in my own head, like when I'm going through a, a challenging circumstance or a problem or a distraction or my finances are, are really bad or they take it a hit or so on and so on. It causes our minds to race many times. Or we, we, we can become fixated on a certain issue. And it causes what? It causes this noise in our heads. It causes this chaos going on inside. And the last thing I think about in the problem of noise is the noise of technology. Amen? The no I'm not talking about just these dings and notifications and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about how technology can consume our time and can cons and distract us from the things that are most important in our lives. I read some research this week and it said that social media usage is up 800% for U.S. adults in the last eight years. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of those things can sometimes, they're not bad, I'm not saying they're bad, they can be used for God's glory, but when we allow them to become distractions for us, when we allow them to distract and to consume our time and our energy, when we should be thinking about how to be spiritually fit, these things can be a problem. 72% of adults own a smartphone. All right, wave at me if you have a smartphone. I've got one. Most of you have one. All right, over 55% of U.S. workers have seen their hours increase in the last five years. An average worker works 48 hours a week. 40% of workers work between 50 and 60 hours a week. And some of us push 70 to 80 hours of work per week. And when I read stats like that and I think about what's going on around me in, in the culture in which I live, in the, in the midst of all of that activity... In the, in the midst of all that noise, this idea of silence and solitude, that is getting quiet and getting alone for spiritual purposes, can seem ridiculous and absolutely not practical for my life. We can have one of two responses when we begin to think about solitude and silence. One, we can think, boy... That sounds really good. That sounds really refreshing. And when I think about that, like my soul gets happy. And I want to find some time to make solitude and, and silence priority in my life. Or you can be like, Brian, you're crazy. You can forget it. You don't know what's going on in my life. My, my life is way too hectic I got too many responsibilities, too many kids, and I just, I, I, got, I got work coming out of my ears and family problems and all this, and I cannot imagine making solitude and silence a spiritual habit in my life. And I would say, you know, if you're there, I want you to hang on with me for a few moments as we look to God's word, because I've been praying that God would speak to us and that he would lead us into this area of solitude and silence in our lives. So let's consider Jesus. Amen?
Let's consider Jesus. Let's look at his life. I'm going to show you some scriptures that are snapshots of his life and his ministry throughout the book of Luke. I just want you to consider Jesus. Because he, he does some things that can really teach us some important truths about solitude and silence. Are you ready? Nobody's ready. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, there you are. All right. Luke chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. I should look at this with me. It says, He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd, everybody say large crowd, of his disciples was there and a great number, everybody say great number, great great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon uh, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people who all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. I mean, think about this snapshot of his life. Great crowd of people, great number of multitudes, and and they're all there to hear a word from Jesus, right? Jesus has got to deliver He's got he's to say something that's profound, right? And people are surrounding him being like, I just want to touch him. I just want a, a piece of him so that I can find and experience truth and healing in my life. Boy, it sounds like my household, really, when you talk about impure spirits and people crawling all over you and pulling at you and all that. Doesn't that sound like a house full of boys? Okay, well, I, could, I thought, boy, he's just describing my household right here. I can barely handle it sometimes. But remember, when we read these scriptures, remember Jesus emptied himself and he took on the very nature of a man. He got tired, he, he got hungry, he got thirsty, he was tempted as, as we are, but yet without sin. And that when the demands and the pressures got high, his experience was the same as ours as human beings. And just like us, he was dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And just like us, he needed to withdraw for times of prayer with his Father. Now keep that in mind. We're going to read also in Luke chapter 8 over in verse 4. It says this, while a large crowd was gathering. Everybody say large crowd again. And people were coming to Jesus from town after town. Come on, say it. From town after town, he told this Parable. I want you to see these pictures. It's just not like Jesus was trotting through life and everything was just hunky dory and there's not demands and there's not pressures, but no, there were people trying to get after him. There was a lot of activity and a lot of things that Jesus was expected to do. Over in Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, a crowd of many thousands. A crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another. Look at the details that the scripture gives us. This was jammed, packed activity. Jesus began to speak to his disciples saying, but listen, I want you to see this. In the midst of all of this, In the midst of the pressures and the demands and the activity that's going on in Jesus' life and ministry, Jesus does something that I think that we can all glean from today. Jesus modeled silence and solitude. Jot that down if you're taking notes with me. Jesus modeled it. He showed us how important it is. And he showed us how to do it. But why? And why is it important? And why did Jesus put such a value on silence and solitude? Number one, jot this down if you're taking notes with me. Jesus got quiet and got alone in order to gain spiritual perspective. 
He needed, he needed a spiritual perspective. He needed perspective from his Father in heaven. He said, I don't do anything except I see my Father doing it. He needed that spiritual perspective in the midst of his busyness and activity. In Luke 4, at 42, it says this, At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. Look how he modeled it. The, pe- the people were looking for him, and when he came to where, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. So it was in that solitary place, that lonely place by himself that he was able to get quiet, to get uh, alone with God so that he could gain a new, a spiritual perspective on his life and ministry. Because in that sentence right there, he describes his purpose. Sometimes we need to get alone with God to remember our purpose. Why is it that we're on this earth? Whose are we? What has he called us to do? Boy, I remember there, when I was called to the ministry back in August 1st, 1997. I remember it like it was yesterday. We grew up in a little house in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Boy, and I was feeling just uh, like I, I was in the first year of my college and I was feeling like, oh, I, I just have a, a discontent about this. There's something more that God wants me to do. I was getting ready to study physical therapy and go in that direction. But I, I remember in my room, by myself, solitude and silence, where I just spend time praying and just said, God, I need, a, I need to know from you what is my purpose in this life. What do you have for me? And I just remember praying that just very quiet, quietly in my bedroom. And that is the first time I believe I ever heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. And he said one word. He said, ministry. And it was in that silence, it was in that solitude that God gave me his perspective. It was where he gave me his direction for my life. And I wonder many times, are we missing out on our sense of purpose because we are neglecting this spiritual habit of silence and solitude? Sometimes... In the course of our lives, whether we mean to or not, our lives become a mile wide and an inch deep. It's silence and solitude that will give you depth. That will take you deeper in your relationship with God. Number two, it's this. Jesus got quiet and got alone with God in order to hear God's voice. In order to hear the voice of his father. And I think sometimes we actually prefer the noise. The noise is comfortable. The noise is familiar. Sometimes we prefer the noise because if we ever got quiet enough to hear God, we might not like what we hear. But it's in those quiet moments that he wants to lovingly Speak to us and give us instructions and give us guidance for his life. Now, here's a confession of a pastor. Sometimes I will even do my own devotion, quiet time, and I will neglect to hear what God is wanting to say to me. I'll say, no, God, I've got, I've got a reading plan here. And I'm just going to stick to my reading plan. I don't care if you want to say something to me. I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to check it off. But I'm, as far as hearing your voice, well, I might not want to be challenged like that, God. I might not want to be convicted like that, God. God. 
But it's in those times where we set aside and get away for times of silence and solitude and we really allow our hearts and our minds to be open to God's voice. That's the most important thing. It's about our relationship with him and hearing his instructions for our lives. In Luke chapter 6, starting over in verse 12 and 13, it says this. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. He spent the night praying to God. And when he came, he called his disciples to him and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated as apostles. So he went to the mountain in order to do what? To pray. And what is prayer? It's communication with God. It's talking with him and allowing him to speak to you. Prayer is about, prayer is about uh, having a, growing in a relationship of intimacy and love with our Heavenly Father. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a mountain? Do you have a place where you can go? To spend alone time and quiet time with God. If you don't, let me encourage you. It is very important that you have a place. And that you have a time to do that. Sometimes, though, we may be afraid of what we're going to hear. But let me encourage you. We miss something very powerful when we neglect this spiritual discipline. We miss something very powerful, and that thing that is very powerful is guidance and directions for our life. Because you look at this scripture, and you see that Jesus did this time of prayer and solitude, and then what? He did some work, right? He knew exactly who to choose as his disciples. He knew exactly what to assign them to do. It's after those times of prayer and solitude where God will give you his instructions for your life. Amen? You guys still with me? All right. Next point is this. Jesus got quiet and got alone in order to seek God's will. In order to seek God's will. How many of you know it's not about us? And it's not about our will, it's about God's will. Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 41. Look at these words. He withdrew. What's that mean? He got alone and he got quiet with his God. He withdrew for about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and what did he do? He prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. See, Jesus is having this critical moment, this crisis moment, and, it's, and he's about to go and suffer. And he's about to go and lay down his life on the cross so that we may experience salvation and eternal life. And he has this moment alone with God where he prays, God, does this really have to happen this way? Because if it does, I'm willing. But I just want to know that this is your will. And Jesus in this moment seeks the will of God and not his own. This is what happens when we get alone with God. We want to seek his will. We want to hear his voice. We want to gain a new spiritual perspective for our lives. If you put all this together, Jesus was able to model for us and show us the importance of practicing the spiritual habits of solitude and silence. In the midst, listen, in the midst of all that activity and all those demands and all of that pressure, Jesus made it a priority. If Jesus, the Son of God, made it a priority, how much more should we? Amen? So what about us? How do we develop this this practice of solitude and silence 
in our lives. This is, this is kind of a difficult thing to, to, to nail down because you have to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. You have to be sensitive to his voice. But I would tell you to consider three different things. Number one is this. Be intentional about it. Like make a choice, make a solid choice and say, God, I realize how important solitude and silence is and I'm deciding right now I'm, I'm going to be intentional. I'm going to make a choice and I'm going to spend a long time with you and I'm going to get quiet in your presence. Be intentional. Make a plan. Look at your calendar. Set appointments. Set dates. Everybody, you showed me your iPhones, right? You set appointments and you get reminders, right? Make this a priority in your life. Amen? Okay. Make a day every week. Make an hour every day. However the Holy Spirit leads you. Make that time and be intentional about it. Number two, I would tell you this. Be creative. As the Holy Spirit leads you and gives you ideas and times and things, you can be creative. Some people get up early. Any morning people in the room? Okay, a few of you. Any night owls in the room? All right. Any middle of the day kind of people? All right, you're my people right there. All right. But get up early. Have your, have your morning coffee and make that your time or whenever your time is best. Go, go on a prayer walk. This is one of my favorite things to do. We live close to Lone, Lone Mountain Park, and I just love to walk around Lone Mountain and pray and just spend time. I've heard people, like, they say, my time is riding my bike. My, ta- my time is taking a jog. Whatever your time is where that you can set that apart to have quiet time with God, alone time with him, be creative in the way that you do that. Some people make it their drive time to and from work. Some people, I mean, I had a friend in ten- Tennessee who uh, visited monasteries. Come on, that's pretty radical, but I don't know if I have the courage to visit monasteries and spend time there, but I'm just saying you be creative and you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you in solitude and silence. Number three is this, be expectant. And what I mean by that is be expectant to hear from God. Be expectant to hear his voice. Be expectant to gain a new uh, spiritual perspective. Be expectant to be, reve- be, to be on the receiving end of knowing what God's will is for your life. Be expectant that you're going to hear from him. Because he's a God, if he leads you to pray, I told you this last week, but I feel like somebody needs to remember this. If he leads you to pray about something, he means you to receive it. So if he's stirring something in you and and he's calling you to these times of prayer, it's for a reason. It's for a purpose. It's so that he can give you his instructions. It's so that he can speak to you and show you his plan and his purpose for your life. And Star, I'll go ahead and invite you up to help me close the sermon. But be expectant that you will hear from God. I love the scripture in Psalm 46, verse 10. It's one of my favorites in the whole Bible. And it's so simple. But it says these words, be still and know that I am God. Right? Be still. Take the time to get alone, to get quiet, and you will know that he is God. Love to look up these scriptures in different translations. Listen to it in the NASB. It says, cease striving and know that I am God. CEV version says, calm down. (laughs) I love that. Calm down and learn that I am God.
Passion Translation says it this way. Surrender your anxiety. Be silent and stop your striving and you will see that I am God. Be still. Stillness precedes revelation. When you are still and you are silent and you get alone with God, you should expect to hear His voice, to know His will, to discover a better spiritual perspective for the things that you're dealing with in your life. Stillness precedes revelation from God. Stillness is what? That silencing of the inner noise. Boy, don't we need some stillness in our lives, in our hearts, where we look away from the troubles, we look away from the situations, the worries, the concerns, and we turn our eyes upon Jesus. look full in his face and we see his mercy, we see his grace we see his love for us and it's in those moments of solitude, silence that we will experience the stillness in which God will speak be expectant that you will hear from God Let me ask you three personal application questions, okay? Don't answer out loud. Just think about it in your heart. Number one is this. Will you seek daily times of silence and solitude in your life? Number two, I want to ask you, will you seek extended times of silence and solitude. How many of you know sometimes God calls us away? It's scary. It can be a risk. But you need to obey because he's got something for you there. When God calls you away, heed his voice and be expectant that you'll hear from him. And the third question I would ask you is, will you start now? Will you commit to make silence and solitude a regular practice, a spiritual habit in your life? Because you need to know that you got to be still and know that he is God. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me, please? So as we put all this together... If we're being attentive to our spiritual life, if we're thinking about the spiritual habits that we're practicing or that God is calling us to practice, Bible intake, first and foremost, prayer, prayer continually, and being a person that is devoted to prayer, as we talked about last week. And then thirdly, what we talked about today is just that that period of time where we get alone and we get away and we get quiet with God. If we put all that together, can you imagine the impact that it would have upon your life? Can you imagine the, the, the better spouse you would be? Can you imagine the better employee you would be? The, can you imagine the, the better employer you could be? Not to mention the better follower of Christ you would be. Because you would be more in tune with what God is doing in your life and around you. You would have that patience. You would have that kindness. You would have that love and gentleness deposited and developed in your life. Will you commit to Bible intake? Will you commit to be devoted to prayer? Will you commit to silence and solitude?
as the Holy Spirit leads you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your word that speaks to us, that challenges us, that corrects us, that moves us in your direction, God. And I pray today for all my brothers and sisters who have heard the word that, Lord, you would grant us the courage and the strength to apply it to our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.